Hey guys, welcome to the recap. My name is Drake. Have you ever found yourself in a place where you, you don't know what to say, you don't know what to do, you don't know how to respond, and you're kind of stuck figuring out your, your next step? Well, I believe there's one thing that you and I can do in those situations, and I believe that one thing has the ability to change everything. So stick around and let's talk about it. Hey guys, welcome to City Church Online. My name is Drake and I'm so glad you're tuning in with us. Listen, as we engage today, we want you to use the chat no matter what platform you're on. If you're on our Church Online platform, if you're on Facebook Live, we'd love for you to take some time now. Let us know that you're there. Remember, listen, we are here for you. We want to know that you're here. We want to know how we can serve you and connect with you. And so why don't you take a moment right now, no matter where you are, summer's kind of coming into motion, the sun's coming out, it's getting hot, and it's time for ice cream. So why don't you let us know what is your favorite ice cream? And maybe if you're lucky, one of your friends is watching, and they'll show up and surprise you with a pint of your favorite ice cream. Who knows? Hey, as you're engaging, a couple of different buttons that are popping up, ways that you can engage. You can actually share that Facebook Live event. You can invite someone to the Church Online platform. We'd be honored if you would use those tools in front of you. Also, you can use the notes tab on our Church Online platform. And if you don't have access to that, man, get you a journal out and a pen and just come hungry and ready to learn that, that we're expecting God to show up in this time as we learn and grow together, that we're going to walk away with some action steps, some things that we can do. And we've been in a series out of the book of Colossians. This is week two. Everybody say two. We're in week two of the book of Colossians. And this is, uh, we're talking about a big Jesus for life's big problems. Anybody got any problems? Holy moly, does our nation have some problems? Does our world have some problems? Are there things that we should be addressing? Listen, we need a big Jesus for life's big problems. The good news is we don't have to build Jesus up to be bigger than he is. We just have to remember who we already said that he was. And so as we get into the conversation today, I'm so excited because I think we're all going to walk away with some really helpful and practical tools. And the conversation today is about praying on purpose. Everybody say purpose. Praying on purpose. It's prayer that changes us and moves us to action. And so as we get into this letter, last week I introduced it a little bit, but this is a guy named Paul who's writing to the church in this city. And as he's writing to them and encouraging them, uh, we see that he's writing from prison. And so like quite literally, maybe for lack of better words, his hands are tied when it comes to being able to help them. And so I can imagine, like, I, if he's in prison, he's wondering, how can I help them? How can I serve them? Like, what can I do to help my friends out? And if you remember last week, we talked about kind of imagining Paul as a, a good dad and a master mechanic, that as he's riding, he's dealing with alignment issues. Like when your car gets out of alignment and you tend to drift, sometimes, uh, you know, us as individuals and churches, we, we drift like, uh, to different degrees. And so he's riding and, and, and helping them. But I want you to notice that as he thinks about how do I help them with alignment and how do I keep them from drifting, uh, in some ways it's really challenging. He's kind of stuck. Like, man, what can I do? And maybe right now, if, if you're like me, you're kind of reflecting on everything that's going on in our nation and everything that's, that we're watching when it comes to justice and, and, and racial issues and tension. And, and we're wondering, like, man, what, what can I do? And, and if you're like me, man, maybe you get stuck and you're like, ah, you're, you're nervous and you're scared. You don't want to say the wrong thing, but you feel like maybe you should say something or maybe you're hopeless or, or maybe you're looking at this and your heart's kind of apathetic toward it or, or maybe you're angry or maybe you're confu confused or, or maybe you're unsure of, of what to, to believe as you watch all the different angles coming out and the different topics. And, and, and can I be honest, I think there's a lot of distraction out there right now pulling us away from the primary issues that we need to focus on and pay attention to. And so if you're like me, you're like, oh man, I kind of am feeling all of this at the same time and I have no idea what I can actually do to help. And I think Paul is in a similar situation. As he's writing to this church, I think he's like, man, what can I do? And what we're going to see in the beginning of this letter, he's going to pray for the church. And I think sometimes we read that and he's like, ah, oh, well, what can I do? I guess, I guess I can pray. But that's not his response or his attitude. He chooses to pray first. He chooses to lead with prayer. And it's because he believes that prayer is powerful. And I don't know where you're tuning in on your spiritual journey. I don't know what you believe about prayer or what you believe about God and what you believe about Jesus. But for those of us that are followers of Jesus, we're going to press into this. And if you're walking in from the outside and checking things out, I just want you to kind of lean in and listen to the why behind the motive of some of the conversation that we're having today. But you might ask the question, like, why do we need to pray on purpose? Why is that important? One of the things that we say here at City Church often is that prayer is our first response, not our last 
resort. And that's definitely the case for Paul. He's in the lead. Before he addresses any alignment issues, before he deals with any how-tos and what to do, he, he prays for them first because prayer is his first response, not his last resort. You say, so why should we press into prayer? Guys, we believe that prayer changes things, that when we seek God in prayer, we have confidence that we're going to experience him in power, that prayer doesn't just change things, but it changes me, that prayer, Jesus taught, has, has the ability to move mountains, and it has the ability to move me. And as I was thinking about it, I wonder which one of those two is harder. Which one's harder to move, a mountain or me? Sometimes I think I'm a, I'm a bigger issue when it comes to changing my heart and changing my mind and changing the direction of my life. But we press into prayer because we believe that's where we experience God in power. We believe prayer makes coincidences happen. And I don't know about you, but I need a whole lot of coincidences, okay? And it's cool. I, I had some friends. We, we started to pray together last week and just encourage each other by saying, hey, hey, here's what we're praying for. And, and over and over again, we're watching these prayers like be answered. And we're like, oh, man, it's so amazing watching God answer prayers. And so if you remember, the, the big idea last week was that belief determines behavior. Belief determines behavior. And we spend some time talking about why that is and why it's consistent, but I think here's the challenge. One of the reasons that you and I, we struggle to pray, one of the reasons we have a hard time pressing into this and, and letting it be a normal rhythm for our life is because we don't believe that there's power in prayer. We don't, we don't believe that it actually has the capacity to change what I see in front of me or to change me. And, and for the record, as we're talking about prayer, prayer is not the, the finish line. It's not like Paul's going to pray and that's all he can do. Prayer is not the finish line. Prayer is the starting line. And you can look at the life of Jesus to see evidence of this. Jesus, he would, he would press in early in the morning, late at night, and he would spend time praying to God for the purpose primarily of, of intimacy with God, that he'd spend time with him and get to know the, the heart of God and, and let it get all over him so he could get out of him, if you will. But he would not only spend time for the purpose of intimacy but for the purpose of empowerment, that he would take that time and then go love the socks off of people, right? I mean, he would just go do amazing things and say amazing things and respond in amazing ways. You say, where does that come from? From time with God, through prayer, as he, as he prepped it all. And what's really cool is Jesus was convinced as he carried out the mission of God, but it was critical that he carried out the mission of God with the heart of God. Right? Like, like if, we, if we miss God's heart in the way that we say things and the way that we respond, it might be right on paper, but it might come across in the wrong way. And so we're pressing into, like, man, what, what does it look like to live out our faith on a practical level, but also not, not say something stupid along the way or, or unintentionally hurt people because we're not paying attention to how we're coming across? Uh, pastor John Gray, he's the pastor of Relentless Church. He kind of helped me frame up some things this week. Um, and he's a black pastor, and he's being very transparent. And he was having some dialogue with uh, Pastor Stephen Furtick, who's a white man. And as they're having this dialogue, here's, here's what he said in response to everything going on right now, especially in response to uh, what happened to George Floyd. He said, in this season, silence is agreement. I don't need you, he's talking to Stephen, his white friend, I don't need you to quietly tell me that you're praying. I need you to publicly say this is wrong in response to the murder of George Floyd. And so as he reflected on the situation, again, we're talking about the power of prayer, that pray, but, but hear, hear me, prayer that doesn't lead to action is not effective. And so John Gray, he goes on to say, listen, I'm, I'm not, I don't need you to feel bad, and listen, I'm a white 30-year-old pastor in Boulder, Colorado, and so, so I, I'm on the same page as we're having this conversation. I'm trying to be humble and learn and listen and grow. And he says, listen, I don't need you to feel bad for being white or for not being black. I don't need you to tell me that you're colorblind. In fact, that, that's kind of uh, uh, nerve-wracking because God's not colorblind. God made us different, and we want to celebrate diversity. And he looks across the room as they're having this conversation, and he says, I, I don't see you as better or, or worse than me. I see you as an equal. And he says this entire conversation, the dialogue that's happening in our country and, and the tension and the hurt and the feelings and everything that's going on, it's, it's not about special treatment. This entire thing is about equal treatment, that black lives matter because it's about equality in this conversation. And he does something incredible as he has this conversation. He says, listen, what Jesus did on the cross 
it, what Jesus did on the cross for me and for you, and the reason the dialogue changes when it gets into the sphere of, of faith and, and being followers of Jesus is because Jesus did something for us that no one else can do. John Gray says that Jesus didn't just save me, but he made us siblings. And by making us siblings, it changes the conversation and it changes how I see you and how I respond to you and the way we have this dialogue. And so then he invites us. He, he said that he's constantly challenging himself to say, well, what does it look like to look at every single person through the lens of grace? That as we're having these really hard conversations and we're not all on the same page how do I extend the same grace to them that I would want to receive as we continue to grow in dialogue and in understanding? Along the same lines, Martin Luther King said it this way. He said, in the end, we will remember not the words of our enemies, but the silence of our friends. And love is compelling us to use our voices and demonstrate in our actions the consistency of the faith that we choose to embrace. And so as we have this conversation today, I just want to help you understand that praying on purpose, it must lead to action. And that we can't separate the two. And so as we look at the conversation today, I want you to see, starting out in verse 3, here's what Paul says in chapter 1 of verse 3. He says, hey, we always pray for you. Again, he starts with prayer. Do you see this? Before he addresses anything else, we pray for you, and we give thanks to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus, for you. I mean, just think about it. Have you ever had someone tell you that they're praying for you? Like, isn't that encouraging? Like, just to know, like, someone's praying for you. So he starts off, and he's encouraging them. Hey, man, I'm praying for you, and I thank God for you. I, mean, I wonder, on the other side of this, like, how many of you could just use some simple encouragement? I want you to know this is true for me. I mean, I'm praying for you. I thank God for you. But how meaningful would it be right now? Could you just stop right now and send a text message and just say to somebody, man, I'm so grateful for you. Or, or, or right now, just send a text and say, man, I, I'm praying for you. And you have no idea how far that encouragement can go. And he goes on and he says, hey, we've heard. Again, he's in prison. He hasn't met these guys. And so he's writing kind of as a, a, a dad who, who, who's, uh, or a granddad maybe that, that's writing to his kids. And he says, hey, we've heard of three things of your faith in Jesus, of your love for all of God's people, which comes from your confident hope of what God has reserved for you in heaven. Three things, faith, hope, and love. You have had this expectation ever since you first heard the truth of the good news of what Jesus did for you. So really quick, to frame up our prayer conversation, I want to give you three marks, if you will, of authentic faith. Three marks, and the first one is faith internally. Three marks of authentic faith. This is not complete faith. This is not perfect faith. This is foundational faith that's going to influence how and why we pray, okay? So the first thing is very simply faith internally. Paul says, hey, I've heard about your faith in Jesus. And I, I, I just want to help you understand that one of the marks of authentic faith, one of the marks of, of a real Jesus follower, of someone who has a relationship with God and is living it out, is their faith internally. What that means is it's an individual faith. It's not your grandparents' faith, it's not someone else's faith, it's not an organizational faith, and it's not faith in faith. This whole conversation is around the object. Paul uses, he says, your faith is in Jesus. It's about the object of your faith. In the same way that most of the time you, 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 know, you sit down in a chair and you don't think much about it, but you put faith in the object that you sit down on and it's going to hold you up. In the same way, we, we are invited to put our faith in Jesus, that we trust that he is who he said he was and that he would do what he said he was going to do, that he was God and he gave his life in our place for our sins, that he was buried, he rose again, and that he gives us access into a relationship with God and can, can give us new life when it comes to how we interact with our love of God and people. And so this faith conversation, it's internal and it's individual. And very, he's just pointing out like, hey, I've heard that you've made this a personal thing, that each of you have a personal relationship with Jesus. And I just want you to evaluate. I don't know where you're tuning in or what you've heard about faith or, or if you think that following Jesus has to do with a list of religious rules that you follow. But very simply, Paul is saying, hey, faith in Jesus, that Jesus is the object of your faith, that what he did for you was enough to make you right with God and give you the capacity to love other people, that that faith is enough and it's individual. So my simple question for you is, have you ever had a moment where faith has become personal for you? Where, you, where you've 
cognitively with your head and your heart said, yes to Jesus, I believe in you, and I want to follow you. What you're going to find is that internal faith goes from your head to your heart to your hands. But it's, but it's not meant to be the other way around. I don't, I don't try to behave hoping that I'll eventually believe. But again, what happens? Belief determines behavior. He goes on. The second point is this, that three marks of authentic faith, that the second one would be hope eternally. So faith internally, but then also hope eternally. Hope, and he, he says, hope of what God have, has reserved for you in heaven. So when it comes to living out like this, this Jesus follower life, there's a faith that's operating internally, but there's also a hope eternally that I, I lean into you. And Jesus talked a lot about heaven. He talked about what, what God has reserved for us, if you will. And the whole point of this is that there's an eternal thing that I'm leaning into that helps me see past my circumstances, helps me survive past the moment at times. And for, for Paul, as he's writing this, it's very intentional. Because of our hope and, and, and because of our faith as Jesus followers, there, there's this different kingdom concept, okay? So uh, he, he would talk about Jesus as, as not, not just servant Jesus and savior Jesus, but as king Jesus. And so Jesus would talk about his father and his kingdom. And so there's this kingdom in, in heaven that, that he's saying, hey, you have a hope and a reward there. And I just want you to think for a moment, like, what do you think the kingdom of God is like? What do you think heaven is like? And Jesus actually taught his followers to pray. He said, hey, pray that God's kingdom would come to earth. And he said the reality of that kingdom coming to earth is by us expressing it in the way that we live. He makes it a reality in our hearts and in minds, and then we, be, we begin to bring that reality to the world around us. You say, why does this matter? What that means is, is that as followers of Jesus, my hope, it actually influences the way that I live, that I'm going to live kingdom down. I'm going to have principles and values that, that are above the culture around me. I'm not going to live culture up. I'm not going to let the culture around me and the media around me and the hot topics around me and the political views around me influence how I behave, but rather I'm going to live kingdom down rather than culture up. Does this make sense? What that means is I'm asking the question, hey, what, is, what am I experiencing right now on this planet that's not going to exist in heaven? You know what's not going to exist in heaven? Racism and bigotry, and riots, and looting, right? As, as we look at things around us, you say, what, what can I speak into? What do I need to be involved in? And anything that's not going to be in heaven, Jesus invites us to address today. And the beautiful thing is it's a both then and now reality that we get to live in. And so the beautiful conversation that we get to be invited into is that faith internally also leans into hope eternally. And what that lets me do is that I get to lean into Jesus for direction rather than the culture around me. I don't, I don't let culture decide how I'm going to respond. Listen, I don't know about you, but there's a lot of pressure and a lot of media and a lot of distraction. And, and, and we're going to look in a minute why, why and how we can look at all of that and interpret it well. But I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to lean into Jesus and ask him for direction on how to learn from these things rather than letting culture influence how I respond. Does this make sense? Just, just lean in for a moment and understand that Jesus invites us into an eternal reality that affects right now. And here's the last one, and here's where it's going, is that it gives us a love externally. It goes from our head to our hearts to our hands. That the demonstration of faith and hope is love. And you know this. And this is one of the reasons that people have such an issue with Christians and such an issue with faith is because we have people that have head conversations and maybe some heart conversations that doesn't show up in their hands and then we're called hypocrites. And listen, none of us are perfect and we're inconsistent, but again, silence in this season is agreement. And so as we look to lean into what does it mean to demonstrate the love of Jesus, you know, Jesus defined it, guys. It's, it's not complicated. We say, what does it look like to love? He defined love not as when you want to and what feels good, but as sacrificial. He told us to love our enemies. He told us to love the strangers. He told us to be hospitable. He told us to love one another. And he demonstrated that love through sacrifice. And, and the big idea here is that love is preeminent over all conflict. What that means is love is bigger than any issue. It's why Jesus could lay his life down in our place for our sin. It's because love is bigger than the issue and the conflict that you and I might have. It means that I'm, I'm going to hold on to the relationship even when it's difficult. And you might be in a, in a place where you're like, man, I just don't have the capacity. I don't have the emotional, mental, physical capacity to love them. I just can't. I can't engage. I don't have it in me. And God says, I know. 
but I can. And if you'll let me, I'll do it through you. And so we're invited into a very consistent reality of faith, hope, and love that, that continually demonstrates itself in the follower of Jesus. Now, here's, here's what's important, is that when we give our lives to Jesus, these things become a reality, but they're not perfected. And so now we're going to watch Paul press into and pray over these things. So look at what happens in verse 6. Um, he goes on and he says, this same good news that, that changed your life, this news about Jesus loving you and has given his life for you, he said, that came to you, it's going out all over the world, and it's bearing fruit everywhere by changing lives, just as it changed your life from the day that you first heard it and understood it, this, this truth about God's wonderful grace. He says, this incredible message of love, it's, it's multiplying all over the world, and he's given them some encouragement. But I, what I want you to hear is, is that real change is only going to happen through what Jesus has done for us. That, that as we're having conversations and we're dealing with racial issues, guys, listen, this is not a legislative issue. Are there things that need to be addressed? Are there social issues that we've got to work? Absolutely. But guys, you can't pass a law to change someone's heart. Only Jesus can do that. And this is why it's so important that we share the love that we've experienced with the world around us. Maybe, maybe most importantly with those that we disagree with. And he goes on in verse 7, and he says, hey, listen, you learned about the good news from Epaphras. Epaphras is the pastor of this church in, in, as he writes to the Colossians, and he says, our, our beloved coworker, and he just takes a moment, and he honors this guy. He says, he's, he's Christ's faithful servant. I mean, he's faithful, he's good, he's awesome, and he's helping us on your behalf. He has told us about the love for others that the Holy Spirit has given you. He just takes a moment, and he honors Epaphras. I want you to think about, man, how, how crazy this is. The word honor, it just simply means to respect and esteem someone. And, and think about it. Our, cult, our culture, like, man, our nation, America, we, we, we love to honor people, don't we? Like, don't we do just such a good job at honoring people? Like, oh, man, aren't our political leaders, aren't they the best at honoring one another? Like, you watch, you know, two political leaders get together on opposing sides, and they just honor the mess out of each other, don't they? I mean, they're just honor, honor, honor. And, and then, you know what, we do a, such a great job as American people. Man, we just are so honoring to, to all of our political leaders and our government officials and to one another. I mean, we are just such a culture of honor. We're constantly respecting and highly esteeming one another. Right? You know, you know how ridiculous that is. We, we are not even close. We are so far from a culture of honor. But here's the deal. Listen, if you're a follower of Jesus, love expresses itself in honor. And here's the beauty about honor is that I can disagree with you and still be honoring. I can fight for justice and still be honoring. So I'm going to leave that on the table and let you wrestle with it. Okay, let's go on before somebody gets mad. Verse 9, um, he, he goes on and he says, so we've not stopped praying for you. So he kind of built a foundation and he talked about like, the, you know, hey, this is the faith that we've heard of in you. And now he's going to pray. And the reason I built this so far is I want you to understand he deals with what's already existing. And then he's going to pray specifically for their growth. And so if you find yourself, you're like, Drake, I don't know what to say. I don't know what to do. I don't know how to respond what we're going to find is as we listen and lean into to Paul's prayer here, we can learn how to pray for ourselves and others. And he says, so hey, we, we haven't stopped praying for you since we first heard about you. And here's what we're praying for you. We ask God to give you complete knowledge. Knowledge. That's simply what you know. Can, can we just be transparent for a minute? Is it possible that you don't know everything going on in our culture right now? Is it possible that you don't know both sides of every argument and conversation? Is it possible that you don't have all the details on every side of the video that you watch on Facebook or on Instagram? Is it possible that you don't have all of the knowledge? He says, we ask God to give you complete knowledge. Why? Because most of the time, our knowledge is incomplete. God, I need help processing what I'm seeing. And we pray that he give you complete knowledge of his will what I'm going to do with it, and to give you spiritual wisdom, which, which, which is different than natural wisdom, right? He, he, he camps on this spiritual wisdom. What is wisdom? Wisdom is the application of knowledge. God, I need knowledge because I don't, I don't know it all. And then I need some spiritual wisdom because I don't know what to do with what I'm seeing. What do I do with the videos? And what do I do with the, 
the, the different opinions and the different points of view and how, how do I respond? Listen, it's, it's okay that we're using our voices, but we need to pay attention not to distract from the main issues. And we need to be humble and listen and learn probably more than we speak. It doesn't mean we shouldn't speak. But I need knowledge and the application of that knowledge. And then lastly, understanding. That's a powerful word. Listen, God, I need spiritual understanding. Because I'm a 30-year-old white man living in Boulder, Colorado, who's trying to listen to his black brothers and sisters. And I, I've experienced what they experienced. And I, don't, I, don't, I can't pretend like I know how they feel. So I need understanding to put myself in their shoes, to feel what they feel, to sit with them and to listen and to learn. And it's so much bigger than this, right? Don't, don't make this just about what's going on. I mean, it should be. But isn't this true in your marriage? Isn't it true in your family dynamics? Isn't it true with your kids? Isn't it true with your coworkers? Just imagine if we would just slow down and pray for these three things, how much it would change the way we interact with one another. Because we could let love lead the way. He goes on and he says, then the byproduct of praying for these things. Check this out. Listen, when we have knowledge and wisdom and understanding and they build on top of each other, you know what happens? The way you live will always honor and please the Lord. And your lives will produce every kind of good fruit. All the while you will grow as you learn to know God better and better. He says the byproduct of praying for these things is that the way that I live begins to change. And this also can be translated the way that you walk. And I appreciate the language because over and over again, Paul uses the language of God as father. And I want you to think of like a father and a kid. You know, like, I, I don't know if you notice this, but you know, typically when we pray or we sing songs as, as followers of Jesus, we're lifting our hands in different ways. You know what that's about? It's, it's reaching up our hands to a good dad who loves us so we can grab them. One of my favorite things right now is, is my little two-year-old Asher, and we'll be walking, and I'll say, hold my hand, and he'll reach up, and his hands are just big enough to wrap around my two little fingers, guys, and, and he holds onto my hand as I guide him where we're going. And Paul is pressing in and saying, listen, as you press into these things, God walks with you through it all as a good dad who loves you. And he's going to help you love others. And I love this picture that you're going to grow. Why? Because your faith is not complete. And your hope is not complete or consistent. Or maybe you, 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 we misplace our hope in different areas. And the way that we love is not complete. You know that. And so we need to grow. But man, listen, my, my little boys, they, they planted some seeds recently in our backyard, and, and you know, they buried them, and they haven't seen them, and Danielle, they've been watering them, and the other day, Grayson comes to me, my four-year-old, and he's like, Dad, Dad, come here, come here, look, 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 and, and we go, and we look at the plants, and there's these little itty-bitty little green buds coming out of the little pots, and they're so excited, it's growing, it's growing, right, and, and it hasn't really produced much yet, I mean, it's not that exciting, but it is to them, why, because it's, it's growing at all. I want you to know God's heart for you and I is not like condemnation and guilt and shame that you don't have your act together, but like, man, any step forward. Oh, man, it's, it's a huge, huge celebration. And God is a good dad is meeting us every step of the way. And he goes on, check this out, in verse 11. He says, we also pray, so he continues, we're just, hey, how do we pray for ourselves? So, so for wisdom and knowledge and understanding. But then he goes on, he says, we also pray that you're going to be strengthened. Everybody say strengthened. Make sure you're still awake, okay? I know this is a lot. Strengthened with all his glorious power. So, so that you will have all the endurance and patience you need. May you be filled with joy. Pause for a second. Watch the flow of thought. I'm praying for strength for you. Why, why do I need strength? Like, like I mean, I, you know, not getting a lot of sleep, and it's been a lot, works a lot. No, no, no. Why do I need strength? Because I need endurance and patience and joy from that strength. Endurance and patience and joy. You know why you need those things? Because loving people zaps all of that out of you, right? If I'm going to love my neighbor, if I'm going to love people who aren't like me, you know what I need? Endurance. 
because I'm not going to immediately understand. You know what? I need patience because they might say something that hurts my feelings or that I disagree with or that I don't understand. You know what? I need joy so I don't lose my cool, that I can have honor and respect in the middle of disagreement. I need strength, and I'm not going to find it in myself because I've got triggers, and you've got triggers, and we've got dispositions that are coming into the conversation. So, man, how are we ever going to, to see change in our lives and in our culture? God, I need strength to give me endurance. I need like some spiritual Gatorade and patience and joy. And check it out, verse 12, always thanking the Father because he has enabled you to share in the inheritance, this is that hope thing again, that belongs to his people who live in the light. He says, man, you always go back to thanking God. Why? Because no matter what your circumstances, no matter how hard life is, no matter how tumultuous it is, you go back while you're praying and you say, God, thank you so much. If I got nothing else, thank you for Jesus, but I'm sure you got something else. And the second that you start going back and thanking God for anything you can possibly think of, you know what it does? It changes your disposition and it fills up your soul and you get endurance and patience and joy and strength. He says, man, we got to constantly go back because we have so much to be thankful for. And this hope outside of ourselves helps us endure the challenge in the middle. Prayer on purpose changes what's inside of me. And prayer on purpose changes what I do. And he goes on to say, you know, why, why would we thank God? I mean, he, he really brings it home. And he says, because he's rescued us. As followers of Jesus from the kingdom of darkness, you guys have heard the Martin Luther King quote, right? That darkness can't drive out darkness. Only light or only love can do that. Hatred can't drive out hatred. Only love can do that. Listen to the language. What do you think he got it? He rescued us from the kingdom of darkness and he transferred us into the kingdom of his dear son who purchased our freedom and forgave our sins. Now look at, look at this translation from the message to kind of close us out, okay? The same, this is this tail end of that, that verse just in a different translation. God rescued us from dead end alleys and dark dungeons. And he set us up in the kingdom of the son he loves so much. The son who got us out of the pit we were in and got rid of the sins that we were doomed to keep repeating. This is not a new issue. It's a heart issue. And as Daniel comes up and he prepares to help us close out and play a little bit, I, I want you to reflect for a moment of, of these sins, this brokenness, this what you can call it whatever you want. But these things that keep repeating. And there's brokenness in my heart and brokenness in your heart. And only Jesus has the ability to change what's inside of us. Legislation's not going to do it. Government officials aren't going to do it. Social leaders are not going to do it. Mass followers uh, on Instagram and, and Facebook, they're not going to do it. But Jesus can do it through you. And Jesus can do it through me. You see, when we pray on purpose, it changes things. It moves mountains. And it moves me. And, and guys, just maybe, it can move you. And so as you reflect on the conversation today, where's your faith internally? You know, maybe you've never even wrestled with that reality, or maybe you've heard about faith and you've never brought it back to the object, the person of who Jesus is and what he did for you. And I want to give you just an opportunity today, man, if you've never responded to Jesus, said, Jesus, I trust you. Thank you for dying for me. Man, you're, you're the one who, who proved God's love for me and my neighbor. You're the one that bridges the gap. You're the one that brings equality, and I need you. And man, you can text the word follow to the number on the screen. And we would love to help answer any questions that you have or celebrate that decision that you're making for the first time today. Maybe it's the hope eternally 
Maybe you've been so focused on what's going on around you that you haven't lifted your eyes up and let the kingdom that God wants to bring in and through you become a reality to give you direction and passion and hope for now. Maybe it's that love externally that, that maybe fear has kept you quiet, maybe fear has kept you from, from dialoguing, and, and, and I understand. But God wants to work in and through you in a way that makes his love known, that pushes past fear and begins to build a bridge. No matter where you are, on your spiritual journey, no matter where you are on the planet today, the beauty of this conversation is you can ask God for help in growing in all three areas, and he'll meet you in that place. You can ask God for help in every interaction, and he'll meet you in that place. So here's my, here's my challenge for you today as we leave this place, as we leave our time together. Would you pray with purpose this week? And here's what I mean. Write this down, don't miss it. Every day this week, God, Give me an opportunity to demonstrate my faith, my hope, and my love to at least one person today. I'll give it to you one more time, and I'm challenging you to pray this every day this week when you wake up. God, give me an opportunity to demonstrate my faith, hope, and love to at least one person today. And when he does, friends, because he will, then you can ask him for help and he'll meet you in that place. Let me pray for you. God, thank you so much for the privilege that we have of learning and growing together. We don't have it all figured out, but we absolutely have confidence that you hear us when we pray and that you have a desire to meet us in this space. You have a desire to help us know you more and to press into that relationship and to let that love flow in and through us. And would it be more than a social media post? Would it be more than just cliche words? God, would we show up in action? We show up in dialogue, we show up in humility, we show up in conversation, and when we speak out for justice. Because Jesus, you leveled the playing field for all of us. And we're grateful for that. So help us to live it out. It's in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for tuning in. See you guys. Hey guys, thanks so much for tuning in to The Recap. It was great to have you. Listen, if we can help you take some next steps or help you get connected, you can text the word NEW to the number on your screen. Or listen, if you made a decision to follow Jesus or you'd like to talk more about that, you can also text the word FOLLOW to the same number on your screen and we'd be happy to help you in any way that we can. See you next time.